And we are back on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escal. Joining us once again is my friend Matt Taibbi, who has recently been part of an initiative called the Twitter Files. After Elon Musk purchased Twitter, he gave access to internal Twitter communications, emails, and so on to Matt and a couple other journalists. They've been publishing those. Uh, I believe the original stipulation was that uh, they originally be released on Twitter. Um, so a lot of people have been following it. Uh, I'll start with, of course, Matt, welcome you back to the program. Thanks for having me, RJ. Ah, always a pleasure. And uh, as I said to you uh, earlier, uh, you know, a lot of the revelations have involved uh, censorship and collaboration on censorship between Twitter corporate executives and uh, fat parts of the government, political parties, and so on. And much of that censorship has uh, been that be, that's been discussed or revealed is of right wing figures. Uh, I think that's fair to say. And so, I think I told you jokingly that. You know, one of my reasons for having you on was that uh, I, I'm tired of hearing friends of mine in the Democratic Party saying, your friend Taibbi. Oh, no, really? <laughs> yeah, because there's this there's this perception. Uh, I know you've dealt with this, Matt. Yep. There's this perception, I think, that because uh, the vast majority, it seems to me, of, uh, of the incidents unveiled uh, so far, uh, seem to be censorship of the right. And, you know, there's the Hunter Biden story, too, which had benefits for Biden and the Democrats politically to have that suppressed and so on, that um, that somehow you might be a tool of Elon and his right wing politics. And um, and I think the bigger picture has gotten obscured. Yes. Yeah. Right. right. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I know a lot of us, myself, and I'd like to know why I was blocked from Twitter for eight months and couldn't get back on. And were you? I didn't even know that. Yeah. Yeah. And I couldn't get an answer until uh, somebody said to me, um, why don't you write their local D.C. lobbyist and CC Jamie Raskin, your congressman? Uh, and after eight months of countless letters and calls and trying their government relations office and everything else uh, and a press office and no luck, I wrote to the lobbyist and CC Jamie Raskin. 45 minutes later, got a text saying, good news, uh, we've reinstated your Twitter account. So I think, you know, a lot of us would like to know what, if anything's more about what might have been happening to the left on Twitter. But that aside, the story has inherent importance. And um, I'm a, I'll let you, I have my opinions for why that is. You've said you agree. Uh, what do you see as the importance of this story? I, I think it's not for one of trying by the Republicans. I think you, you definitely see if you go through the email record that overwhelmingly the number of requests that come in come in from uh, the from the Democratic side. Like I ran searches for RNC and DNC versus all of the people in the trust and safety side of the company. Uh, and on the DNC side, you see one request after the other. Can you look at this account? Can you look at this account? On the RNC side, it's all the RNC is suing us, uh, uh -huh. you know, and is that because the company inherently, you know, uh, goes after conservatives, or is it because the Republicans realize they're they're just not going to get any traction with that company, um, and they don't try? You know, this last thread that I did documents an effort by the State Department under Mike Pompeo to get a series of emails, a series of accounts um, looked at, and Twitter sort of resists. The idea of doing that but ultimately they do accede to requests from um from that state department as well uh and i think people are kind of missing the forest for the trees here a little bit because 
the the big picture story is really not about Republicans or Democrats, but about the machinery of this, mm-hmm. which is really about a a very popular international platform that has a very powerful tool for getting people to organize organically and having that be under very, very close scrutiny and control of uh, law enforcement and even the intelligence agencies. Um, It doesn't really matter what the parties are. I think that's the key revelation in all of this stuff. And what's interesting about it to me, Matt, and, you know, maybe that for our listeners, we have to go into a little more detail at some point. But what's interesting to me about it is that uh, most of these emails uh, and other communications took place around when uh, a Republican was president, right? So, most so you, you have a sort of, uh, you know, and here I'm going to sound like a right winger, but you have a sort of Paris state or deep state as well as political thing going on here where you have members of the FBI in Trump's own government, uh, theoretically, uh, Trump's own government, uh, making some of these requests. You have, and then uh, you have the Democratic Committee, as you've said. Uh, and I, it's interesting to me that you say there was a dearth, a lack of uh, requests from the Republican side. Of course, during almost all of this period of the Trump presidency anyway, Trump was benefiting greatly from Twitter, right? Oh, yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. So maybe there was very little motivation to, uh, you know, also to arm twist Twitter or... Uh, but one of the things I thought was significant about some of these communications is that um, you really had a, an element at times of resistance from uh, from the Twitter folks. It seemed, uh, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, because there's so much minutia to this, and you've been going through it for so long, and I've just been reading it. So you know, but but. It seems to me you have a number of times, this is so closely linked to the Russiagate story to me, because you have, you had a narrative begin after 2016 that was Russia stole the election, Russia uh, subverted social media, and that's the only reason Democrats aren't doing better. I mean, we don't have that story about 2022, and yet, you know, they lost the house and so on. But still, there's that story had a lot of traction. A lot of people were aggressively putting it. And there's one point in the interchanges where is it the FBI that expresses uh, what seems that they seem to be chiding Twitter for not coming up with more examples of Russian manipulation of information. Do you, do you, do you remember what I'm talking it's, about? Yeah, it's, it's the Senate Intelligence Committee that, that okay. is most vociferous about that. And that's, it's the ranking member, Mark Warner from Virginia, uh, the Democrat in early 2017. It, it, it's actually kind of comical when you read the, the record because what happened was, uh, and forgive me for going into the weeds, but it's hard to explain sure. otherwise. It's important. Yeah. yeah. So Facebook made the original decision to come to go public and say, we found evidence of Russian activity on, on our platform. And they did that in August of 2017. And they did this thing that Twitter really didn't like. They sent the results of their research to Congress and the Senate Intelligence Committee and to Twitter at the same time. Hmm. Uh, so that kind of lumped Twitter in with Facebook. And at that point, Twitter was really on nobody's radar as part of the story. And um, the Senate Intelligence Committee started looking through this big pile of emails. Now, Facebook originally identified 300 accounts that it said were linked to uh, essentially the Russian internet research agency, there were only a handful that were even asserted to be directly created by the IRA. But, um, but they wanted a big number. uh, And, and Twitter did its own analysis. And they came up originally with the following numbers, they had 22 high risk accounts, and 100 179 other accounts 
that they said were were linked to those accounts. So those weren't even necessarily Russian accounts. They were just linked to them by retweets or following activity or whatever. When they gave that data to the Senate Intelligence Committee, War Senator Warner didn't even reply to them. He immediately went out into the hall and held a press conference and blasted their response as inadequate on every level. Uh, and there was this, this immediate torrent of negative press that was thrown Twitter's way. And they were in shock. They hired Burson Marsteller that night, um, mm -hmm. the crisis management team. Uh, and there was this very telling line, I thought, in the email by the, the senior Twitter executive who met with Warner. He said, Warner's under intense political pressure to keep this story going and to keep and he's pressuring us to keep producing material. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the meaning of that is pretty clear that now they ended up doing another internal examination and they just didn't find a whole lot. Uh, and that ended up being a real problem for them. It wasn't until they hired an outside law firm to do a broader, more generalized search that turned up bigger numbers that they they were able to kind of get out from under the 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 story a little bit. But that was the way that that the government got into Twitter was through that story. So they felt vulnerable, politically vulnerable, and they felt they needed to. Um, uh, cooperate and uh give, and give sorry just to interrupt ahead, this really sure, quickly sure. There, yeah. there were two things that were kind of hanging over twitter's head at this moment one was twitter wanted to pass uh, legislation that would have severely limited their ability to sell advertising internationally and like twitter to, did who wanted to pass that legislation the senate the, the senate actually both houses were going both to houses yeah that. Uh, and then there was another, uh, there was an additional white paper that, that Warner wanted, had already written up that had all sorts of regulatory um, measures that they were thinking of passing that would have been very financially punitive. And you see, you see in the emails them talking about legislation that may affect our advertising and that, all, all that kind of stuff. Right. So they were very worried about the financial hit they were going to take. So, so all this sets the groundwork for the communications that you and the other journalists have revealed. Um, the uh, presumably with the you know I don't know if Elon was bringing you donuts and coffee or whatever or while you were doing this, but one of the things I think that has. Uh, you know, I would, I'm sorry for struggling, but I, I would like this story to have more impact among liberals in the left than it's having. And one of the issues that I think, the obstacles is that they say, well, there was, it was given to Matt Taibbi and Barry Weiss, who is kind of a B-A-R-I, for those who don't know, who used to write for the New York Times and is, you know, considered a kind of right-leaning uh, intellect, so-called intellectual dark web type. And Schellenberger, Michael Schellenberger, I guess, is the third. So they're basically, mm -hmm. sorry? And Lee Fong. Oh, and Li Fong. Okay, that's right. They added Li Fong later. Now, Li Fong, you know, and you have more of a left-leaning reputation, but I, I think there was the sense that, um, it falls, but the sense that, well, this was a, a political manipulation maneuver from the right. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I, I don't, and I've heard these criticisms that, oh, you're cherry picking the data. And right. I mean, I don't even know what the response to that is, as opposed to what, uh, you know, I, I mean, every news story is cherry picked. If you're if you're a prosecutor going to trial, you're cherry picking ev evidence. I mean, you, you we're going through these emails. If I if I had seen an email, well, for instance, I have an email that from the FBI that says, OK, we'll, we'll tell you what the, the intelligence community um, is looking at. And DHS will tell you what the states are seeing. Right. If I had another email that said that's not true, um, right. I would obviously publish it. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, so I'm not trying to make a case. I'm not trying to build something that isn't there. I think, uh, you know, in my first thread, I was actually told by uh, former senior executives of the company 
that there had been requests by the Trump administration that had been honored. I was told that by enough people that I felt obligated to put it in, even though I wasn't finding those in the record. Um, so, you know, I, I'm putting in what's there. I mean, I, there's the, the fact of the matter is if you go through this record, you're, you're not going to find a different story. Um, right. And I think people are maybe a little bit in denial about, you know, they're focusing on the partisan angle of this, which I think is is much more temporary and tertiary than they think. Whereas what's really, really significant in my mind is how, how quickly they built up this very, very um, uh, smoothly functioning architecture of uh, sort of digital censorship and, and this is something that that has happened in other countries where the the left right picture is completely different. Uh, so I, again, I think people are missing the point if they're focusing on that. You know, uh, let's talk about that architecture a minute, Matt Tai, because it, it, it seems to me there's also still not a clear understanding of what that looks like. For example. Uh, you know, I can be kicked off Twitter or any social media. Uh, I can be suspended, uh, or people can just not see what I write, right? I mean, these are all, but, but even the last example, that's censorship because people who would normally see, uh, something that someone's written, uh, I forget what the term that amplification. Visibility filtering. Uh, uh, uh amplif which filtering visibility visibility filtering it's insidious that that is to me and it seems to me that uh one of the big stories here it, it may not be through a sort of partisan frame and i think you're right about that but i think in terms of information access and who gets filtered and who doesn't uh, for example, somebody who speculated that uh, COVID-19 might have originated in a lab or w w would be censored in one way or another, yet a year or two later, there was open discussion of that possibility. I think the conclusion was uh, it didn't happen, but if it's something that might have happened, then it's a legitimate topic for discussion and uh, we're certainly not talking about uh you know certainly lives are at stake but we're not talking about state secrets or anything like that um so we find uh, what troubles me about it is that it would trouble me if it was you know just suppressing certain political points of view but to me it's also suppressing certain kinds of scientific speculation maybe irresponsible but still who gets to decide becomes the critical issue uh as well as uh, you satire, know satire some other things yep mm -hmm. what's that satire even satire is a top yeah satire is definitely a tough one and um anything that's out of the main stream point of view. And this is, to me, where I think people on the left should be taking this story a lot more seriously. Because, uh, you know, first they came for the, uh, you know, whatever that, uh, right, right. Uh, you know, Reinhold Niebuhr or whoever, Diethofer, Diethofer I guess. Well, uh, but, you know, the fact is that some of the ideas the left admires most were considered extremely fringe. Uh, decades ago, and I think it's naive to think that the left isn't or won't be at some point the target of all of this, number one, and number two, um, that uh, freedom of speech itself is a principle. So uh, to me, I'm going through this stuff for that reason, because it makes me extremely nervous when party organizations can censor speech. I worked for the Bernie Sanders campaign in 2016, so I know what party organizations can do to the political process there. Uh, I don't like to see it happening here. Uh, and uh, I don't, I especially get nervous. Maybe it's because I'm a product of the 60s, but when people put their faith in the FBI and the CIA, 
uh, I think they're forgetting an awful lot of history. Um, Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and there's really two big uh, machines that we've learned a lot about since we started doing this. And one of them is what, what we just mentioned before, the visibility filtering aspect. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I think maybe a year ago, if you asked most people, is there such a thing as shadow banning? Um, some people would have said to you, oh, that's, that's a myth. They don't do that. Uh, that's a conspiracy theory. Uh, well, we found out concretely that not only is shadow banning a thing, but it's much more sophisticated than anybody uh, could possibly imagine. They can completely control the level of visibility for any user, and it doesn't matter what their political affiliation. They can they can dial it all the way down to this person cannot be searched, uh, and they can dial it all the way up to being amplified. Now, I I, I understand the amplification process less because apparently that takes place in another part of the company. Oh, really? But, but uh -huh. the, the suppression aspect is incredibly sophisticated. They have they have a whole mess of tools that they can apply to to people. They can put automated heuristic tools that they individually create. So in other words, uh, anytime someone says the word, uh, you know, lungfish in Brazil, like we can we can zap that, right? That that would be what they call a bot. They'll just throw that out there into the ether, and that will automatically moderate those accounts. But I think the key is that if you look at individualized accounts, you will see that that uh, they have all sorts of labels on them, like. Um, you know, there's a there's an account for the Stanford Dr. J. Bhattacharya that says trends blacklist, right? Which means this person cannot trend. Uh, doesn't mean that they're, they can't be seen, but, you know, they can't trend. Or there might be another one that says um, that that's like followers only can can search for this person. Right. And so they have so many gradations. And the concern that I have about that is not just about individual censorship but about the warping of reality like what happens yeah. when you when you dump um 50,000 of these things out into the ether and what are people seeing are they seeing a real representation of reality or are they getting this very strange um automated dystopia uh that doesn't really reflect what people think i i think that's very dis disturbing and again it doesn't have anything to do with partisan politics the other big thing that we've learned has to do with the relationship with the government. Now, this is where I've been spending most of my time. And this is disturbing because they have a very concrete system of uh, sort of moderation requests that come in from all over. And I think that's very dangerous. They have a, they have a written internal guidance at the company that any account that the um, that the intelligence community deems to be a foreign uh, actor committing cyber operations will be removed. Um, that's their internal guidance, guidance, whereas publicly they say, um, we do that at our, at our sole, sole discretion. So that's very manipulative and very scary. I, I, I think people need to understand that, that they're, what they're looking at when they look at any social media, including like things like Wikipedia, um, they're looking at something that's that's kind of more managed than they might imagine. Yeah, I've all you know the example that I use in the Twitter files just really made it concrete was Ma Bell with mind control was uh, you know right. I wrote a piece exactly. with that title because back uh, fifty years ago, uh, Bell Telephone had an absolute monopoly on telephones. But what if they could have controlled it so that? you never knew a person even called you right. or, or uh, in the middle of the conversation, they said something about uh, an epidemic and you never even knew they said it. So you don't respond. You know, I mean, this is the level of, uh, you know, I, I think you've put your finger on it, that this is manipulating reality in a way that is deeply disturbing. And, uh, you know, I do think they all do it. Uh, I was, I, I never did much moderating on Wikipedia, but my Wikipedia entry was taken off 
and I was blocked. Really? From, yes. And I was blocked from editing from Wikipedia for two years. And the comment was, uh, individual takes an excessive issue in the topic of Israel, Palestine. And I, maybe I did two things about Israel or Palestine, but, um, and my bios, my uh, profile still isn't there. Um, so crazy. Yeah. And Facebook, I always wonder why if I put I've stopped putting up articles or clips from this show there because and I'm sorry to speak from my own personal experience, but it's my, huh? yeah, it's anecdotal, but it's, uh, because nobody sees them. So I put up when, you know, I have a birthday or my, you know, kids have a birthday or something and I get a bunch of people responding. So, you know, I mean, uh, I think this is, uh, this is a, a critical issue. And I, to me, Matt, uh, you know, it, 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 and another reason why I wanted to talk to you about it, it's so interwoven with some of the other big stories of the last five years, I think, because uh, you know, Russiagate, obviously, you know, COVID, uh, you know. Uh, COVID, of course, and the Hunter Biden laptop. Uh, one of the things that absolutely stunned me in the response to an argument about the Twitter files, some of which I've participated in, is the extent to which I hear see people on social media or in email conversations or whatever. So I don't care about Hunter Biden's dick pics. I mean, Democrats who are you know supposed to be the readers, the literate, the you know, when the article in question was literally a headline hunter biden's emails revealed they don't you know there's this reductive thinking i think that prevents people from understanding the uh the depth of uh, of the issue we're up against and you and i've talked a million times now about the media and their role in all of this but i think that people uh I just don't know how to get through to them. And I'm glad you've reached the phase in this project where you're starting to um, uh, integrate it and sort of make a coherent story out of it. Because I think, I think it, 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 as I understand the requirement was, you know, was as you found things to put them out on, on Twitter first and so on, which is, uh, for you as a journalist, can't have been the easiest way to do it because you're not putting you're not building the whole story as a coherent thing and putting it in context. Uh, was that a challenge for you? Yeah, it's certainly a different kind of writing for sure. Uh, like I think you, you, you have a desire always to try to explain things and, um, you know, the, this forces you to really just take, uh, the sort of loudest examples of things and stick them out there and hope people get it. Um, it, it's not the easiest way to do things, but I do think I was initially very skeptical of putting uh, all this material up on Twitter. Later, though, I did I did see that it had, um, you know, an interesting effect, right? Like, first, there's the irony of it using Twitter to right. go after Twitter. But, um, you know, Twitter, I think, are originally the the attraction to it around the world was that it was this anarchic uncontrollable thing um right you know it, it, you, it moves faster than the speed of of conventional news um you know a, a movement can break out faster than anybody can even get a hold on get, get hold of it and those original qualities i think make something like the twitter files um it helps amplify it right because before anybody can even build a counter narrative if you keep dumping more and more material out there uh it, it you can move you can move ahead of the news cycle and i hate to bring up this example because people will will detest it but this is what donald trump figured out in mm -hmm. 2016 which is if you create news faster than the news can react you can always be ahead of them and always always put them on the defensive and i think it, to some extent that was a strategy for some of us with the twitter files like let's just put this stuff out there faster than they can respond to it and it'll have a life of its own and it does um to a, to a degree but you're right at some point you have to sit back 
and say, all right, what does all this mean, really, right? And I, and I think we're finally getting to the point where we can breathe and start to do that. And I guess the downside of that approach, I get what you're saying, the downside of the approach, though, is that I think a lot of people fall into reflexive crouches when they just get a burst of information. Then they're like, well, that's where you get the Hunter Biden's dick pics reaction is, or whatever it is, is because they're just reacting to a, 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 a quantum of information rather than the whole thing. But Matt, before I let you go, you made a great uh, point, important point that I, that I just wanted to underscore because and get your thoughts on, which is, you know, mentioned Twitter and its role in social movements. Everybody rightly celebrated the Arab Spring, what now more than 10 years ago, uh, as being the first great Twitter fueled movement against these authoritarian governments in, in Egypt and elsewhere in the Middle East. If the Egyptian government, if the political parties of Egypt had been able to lodge complaints, well, you know, this represents, uh, uh, this tweet rep or, or hashtag represents a threat to the government, which it actually did, then uh, we wouldn't have had something like the Arab Spring, right? So we we wouldn't have had Black Lives Matter if the right people had, you know, if the people in position had decided that that was bad. I I remember that Susan Rice immediately came out and said Black Lives Matter might be a Russian operation. People forget this, and then within like three days, no, the part, no, no, the party likes Black Lives Matter as well. It right. should in my opinion. But I mean, if the decision had been made, no, this is some kind of foreign thing, we might not have had Black Lives Matter the way we did. We, it, it, this is what I guess has been frustrating me about this story all along. If you agree, I'd love your thoughts. And then maybe in closing, uh, anything more you might be doing with this information. Yeah. First of all, I've, I've actually seen reports from the government um identifying black lives matter accounts as the, the last one i saw was the uh, iranian propaganda um maybe in some cases that's actually true i don't know but but uh there there were there were a number of those more commonly what you see and this is what's what's i think terrifying about the whole thing and it gets back to what you're saying about the arab spring but you will see these reports come through that are incredibly short. They're like, you know, a paragraph, two paragraphs long, and it comes from God knows what agency. It's not even specified, right? You can see that the, that the document is created by the FBI, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. Um, and it just says, we assess that these accounts um, were created by the Internet Research Agency for purposes of, um, you know, sowing social division. And that's it. And then they will send you an Excel doc with, you know, a thousand ninety five accounts. Right. And Twitter either has to manually go through each of those accounts and actually make a decision about them or just do what I what it looks like they're doing in a lot of cases, which is um, either suspend them or flag them or put labels on them. And I think that's a very that's that's a striking and dangerous power for the government to have uh, to just be able to willy nilly create lists of things and just send them to a company and have them taken care of that way. Uh, as you say, there are movements that are really, really threats to uh, governments, but maybe they should be right. right? Uh, and and so what happens if you have a company like Twitter or Facebook or, you know, even Pinterest is on the list of these uh, these uh, groups. What what if they're actually all engaged in this patriotic effort to sort of keep things going? Well, I don't know that that's that's right. Right. I mean, that, that's certainly not in the American spirit, it seems to me. So um, I think this is very worrying uh, and people should I, I understand that there's a lot of partisan, you know, uh, reservations about this. But I, I, I hope that people take a, a, you know, a moment to think about the larger implications of it, because it's pretty it's pretty freaky. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good place to stop. So again, Matt Taibbi, author, journalist, uh, his website, Taibbi, T-A-I-B-B-I dot substack dot com. And of course, you can read his many books. Uh, yeah, thanks for doing this work. Thanks for sticking with it. And uh, I look forward to seeing how you, you wrap it up. And as always, thanks for coming on the program. Thanks a lot, Richard. Appreciate it. Have, have a good one.
Yeah, you too.